Okay, greetings. On behalf of Bet Yeshurun Assembly, welcome to another in our Bible study series on the Creator's Time. To those participating via Zoom or are tuned into our podcast or watching a recording on our YouTube website, this is Kurt Ranger speaking. I'll open with thanks to my Heavenly Father, Yahoo Elohim, and my Lord and Savior, Yahushua, for the traveling mercies that brought us here safely this afternoon. It's another cold day in February. It's warming up a little bit, and that sun always helps. So I'm grateful to Yah that so many believers are gathered in this warm sanctuary to praise and worship on a Shabbat and to hear from the word. I want to thank Sister Kim again for technical support with this presentation and for helping me record it so that others may watch it later. I also pray our pastor Obadiah is doing well on his sabbatical and wish him a safe return home real soon. I welcome this opportunity to share some of my studies on the Creator's time. My prayer is that through a study like this, we can become spiritual lights to those who are in the dark about these matters. While many claim to have knowledge of the divine system of timekeeping, sadly, most don't understand it. So I encourage you to continue seeking an understanding of Yah's truth in regards to the Creator's time. May we work diligently with the help of the Holy Spirit to learn about our Heavenly Father's way of life. And may our praise for that come not from humans, but from Elohim. And may we all hear, when physical time no longer matters, well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah. Today's talk is entitled Divine Annual Appointments. Some may recall a few of these slides from last year's presentation. For you, should serve as a, as a recap. Others may find these highlights helpful in preparing for the upcoming cycle of festivals this spring. Plus, we'll now have a, a recording of this video teaching on our YouTube website for others to study later. As with previous talks, this one relies on the canon of scripture, which helps us measure how our way of life, uh, helps us measure how our way of life stacks up to uh, Elohim's way of life. I consider all of, of scripture to be divinely inspired and cert it serves as a cornerstone of my faith, which I build upon. And in scripture, you can see it, Yeshua also pointed to himself. Matthew 21, 42. Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was Yahuwah's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. This presentation gives passages from the New King James Version of our Bible, unless otherwise noted. It also has verses from ancient apocryphal hidden books. Um, I also refer to other resources like Strong's Concordance, Smith's Bible Dictionary, and, and the lexicons of Thayer and Jacinius. I also strongly encourage you to uh, review these uh, you, the YouTube video series, which can be found, uh, I've listed some of them here, but there's many, many studies that Pastor Obadiah has given over the years, especially on, on the topic that we're going to be covering today. So I strongly encourage you to uh, review these video series, and uh, it's a great way to spend these cold winter evenings. I have a thought. Today's thought for meditation comes from the book of Daniel. As an exile taken from Jerusalem, that represents a, a place of Yah's peace. He was transported into Babylon. That represents a land of social and political confusion. Daniel was gifted with Elohim's wisdom. He shared that divine wisdom with the leaders who enslaved his people. Furthermore, he lived according to those divine teachings and instructions as best he could under the circumstances he was in. Indeed, his life and words are meant to be examples for those living in the latter days, like us here in America. For the most part, Daniel's book is found in Scripture's canon, yet some of it is hidden in apocryphal writings. His book dates back to 500 B.C. and was read by Yah's ancient priest in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So even from his grave, he still prophetically reveals modern-day events about how Elohim's kingdom will triumph over the world's insanity. As children of light, we are meant to share our understanding of divine wisdom with others who are in the darkness of ignorance. 
consider his message found here in Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. Blessed be the name of Elohim forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and dark secrets. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. So may we be dwelling with him, get into that light. Also note there that it's Elohim that's in charge of the times and the seasons. We're very familiar, and we went reviewed them a couple of weeks ago, about the calendars, the times and the seasons that the world sets up. The one in charge is Elohim. So let's get a, uh, a recap. The Heavenly Father is the one that sets the times of his family meetings. While studying the Creator's time over the years, uh, chapters 28 and 29 of Numbers soon became a favorite source of information. Note how the Heavenly Father begins to instruct Moses to teach Israel about his appointed times during their 40-year desert journey in Numbers 28. One through two. Now Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Command the children of Israel, say to them, My offering, my food for my offerings made by fire is a sweet aroma to me. You shall be careful to offer to me at their appointed time. So, right there, those of you who are familiar with the Hebraic uh, language, that Moed is that word for the appointed time, and it's Moedim in plural. So, right at the beginning, when Israel didn't even have a clue what the appointed times of Yahuwah were about, Moses was sent to them with that direction. Here's the, uh, and I'll be giving you some of the, the times, the appointed times of Yah, and I'll, and I'll start with this one. Notice it's the, the daily time. You can find it in both Numbers 28 or through three through eight, but also I'll give you a second witness to it. It's in Daniel eight through 12, uh, eight verse 12. And um, he begins with those daily meetings, those one-on-one -on -one times we spend in prayer. These are opportunities to keep our spiritual relationship intimate with Abba Father. Since he asks us to meet with him each morning and evening, we can be certain that he's listening to what's on our heart. If we're real quiet, we may even hear him whisper back. Yeah. And I love that song that we started off with. Every day is sweeter, yeah. sweeter than the day before. Yeah. Right out of scripture. Yeah. Now here's uh, some more of the passages. And again, this is like an outline for you. You can go back and check all these out and get familiar with each of these different times. The weekly, the monthly one we talked about, uh, I think it was a week ago. There's also seasonal uh, Appointed times of Yahuwah, and then the, the first fruit harvest, the Pentecost, that we, we keep here at, uh, at Bet Yesharun. Now, these, these passages there and their second witnesses support what we, why we gather at Bet Yesharun for those feasts. Uh, these verses also provide details to us on how to fellowship with our Heavenly Father and with our spiritual brothers and sisters encourage you to check these passages out and as well as to watch those YouTube video recordings mentioned earlier. And uh, you'll learn about the physical and the spiritual aspects of our praise and worship services here at Bet Yeshurun. And it's all about Yahuwah and his son, Yahushua. And I um, also want you to consider this passage here from uh, Leviticus 23, one through two. Yahuwah spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them concerning the feast of Yahuwah, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, meetings, assemblies, gatherings, even these are my feast. So these are Yahuwah's feast, Yahuwah Elohim, and it's about his son, Yahushua. It's not about Bet Yeshurun's feast or Kurt's feast or pastor's feast. It's really about Yah's feast. And that's what we're here uh, studying and looking into scripture to find the confirmation so you can be convicted to come to the Heavenly Father's special family meetings. 
share for you this, uh, this slide here, which is a, uh, a good, uh, I like this one because it's cyclical. We posted this one up briefly last uh, week for you. And uh, also want you to see these outer rings, these monthly praise and worship services at Bet Yesharoon, or each of those months. Notice how those, those months are all 30 days. Let's see the 30, the spring season, and we come around. So there's the calendar, 364 days, because you have these, these seasonal inner rings where we meet uh, also for uh, some people might be more comfortable calling them leap days, but it's again, it's days that, that keep each of the seasons aligned with the physical that, that Yah created. So there's the, the spiritual aspects tied in with the physical aspects. Now, again, Yahuwah, Elohim, calls annual family meetings. Last, those showed the seasonal and the monthly ones. And here's, again, right out of um, Numbers 28 and 29. List them all for you. So you can go back and study each of those. Passover, Unleavened Bread, Day of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Tabernacles, Last Great Day. We're going to go over those um, briefly today. Um, but I want you to consider this. I, I posted the, uh, the first verse of Numbers 28. Now here's the closing verses from Numbers 29. What you're seeing is a bookend. When you see this in scripture, that means everything in between these kind of like a, a repeat of a message. Very important. Type, those are the types of things you should go back and spend some time reading and studying and, and meditating over them. Because here's what it, uh, Yah says in Numbers 29, 39 through 40. These you shall present to Yahuwah in your set appointed feast, your Moedim, beside your vowed offerings and your free will offerings as your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, your drink offerings and your peace offerings. So Moses told the children of Israel everything just as Yahuwah commanded. So catch that point. Moses was sent to teach Israel and why? Because they had forgotten everything. Keep, uh, keep in mind, they were in uh, Egypt for over 400 years. And at the end, they were slaves. So they didn't have any idea of, about Yahuwah's feast. And that was Moses' command. So let's get into some of these right now. Passover, start with the first one in spring. Behold the lamb. It's the passage. Exodus 12, 2 through 3. This month shall your, shall your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. I'll address uh, right here a, a common um, misconception. Passover isn't a one-day event. It really begins, the preparations for it begin on the 10th day of the first month. So a lot of people just like that one evening celebration really starts sooner than that. You'll find that also in the New Testament too. It's not just coming out of the Old Testament. Track that one down for homework. Exodus 12, 6 through 11. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. It is Yahuwah's Passover. Another misconception here. Passover isn't about an event. It's about a sacrifice which is commemorated on day 14 of the first month. Notice that verse testifies that, that Yahuwah's Passover is that lamb. That sacrificed the lamb. Thus, each spring, that Yeshurun memorializes Yahushua's sacrifice as the Passover lamb of Elohim. His death delivered us from the slavery of sin, just like the sacrificed lamb in ancient times pictured Israel's deliverance from Egyptian slavery. Passover, like all of Yah's feast, represents a step in Elohim's plan of salvation. It's important. He's trying to teach us. Exodus 12, 14. 
So this day shall be a memorial to you. You shall keep it as a feast to Yahuwah throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Yeah. Wasn't done away with. It's an everlasting ordinance. There's a spiritual message Yah wants his people to catch. And he repeats it every year for us. So don't worry if you didn't get it the first time or you know you feel ah, it just wasn't quite right and I'm not getting it all. It's coming around. You saw that cycle. It's going to repeat each year. So just hang in there. Keep coming. Keep reading. Keep studying. Keep talking to those in your assembly. So here it is. Picture there. Passover. Here's the words so that you can uh, Pasak, the Hebrew, Pascha, the Greek, refers to the sacrifice, the victim of the feast, the lamb. It's a memorial of Yahushua, our Redeemer. So again, important message that you catch. Passover is not about the big dinner and everyone eating and, and just celebrating and having a good old time. Yes, it's part of that. There's a much deeper spiritual message for you to consider. The Lamb of Elohim died for us. Yeah. Yeah. Exodus talks about it. Exodus 12, 26 through 27. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? That you shall say it is the Passover sacrifice of Yahuwah who passed over the houses of the children of Israel and Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our household. So again, there's the picture. We're seeing the Lamb. That's what was going on there but it still was the Passover sacrifice of Yahuwah. I want you to always remember that. But let's look into the, uh, the spiritual portion of this too. Paul speaks of it. Therefore, out of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly unleavened, for indeed Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Again, confirmation in the New Testament. The Messiah is the Passover. Yeah. He's the sacrifice. It's all about Yah. Yeah. Paul was also talking about some other things. Now, this looks pretty good to me. Unleavened bread, a little wine there. That's a feast of unleavened bread. Yes, Passover does lead off a seven-day festival of unleavened bread. Now the, the KJV translates unleavened bread from the Hebrew word matzah. Familiar with that one? Taste it. It's not the greatest taste and stuff. But it's good with wine. Describes an unfermented cake that's baked without a leavening agent like yeast. Those of you who like to track down the Greek, leaven in Greek, in the zume, it's a metaphor of mental and moral corruption. So you're starting to see the transition from the physical into the spiritual teachings that come about when you're reading scripture. So you start tracking down these, uh, these words. So without leaven means it's without mental or moral corruption. Important message to catch. Numbers 28, 17 through 18. On the 15th day of this month, oh, didn't catch that one. See that moon crept in there. I thought, I, I thought I've eradicated those things. They pop up all the time. The 15th day of this month is the feast of unleavened bread. It shall be eaten for seven days. On the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. So, yeah, is uh, instructing us to, uh, instructing Israel. And remember, we are of Israel, the definition of Israel. It means humans that are wrestling with evil and are going to survive by hanging on to Elohim. We are in that bunch. Yes. At least I am, and I suspect most of you here, because I can see you're here with me. Yes. So we are struggling, so let's hang on to El. Yes. That's yes. through this word. And we're taught here to eat matzah. Passover um, lamb on the night, but uh, it, the important message here, it memorializes their deliverance 
from slavery. Eating bread without yeast signifies that they quit eating Egypt's physical bread, which pictures the teachings of a corrupt system of slavery. Likewise, Bet Yeshurun memorializes our freedom from worldly teachings with an annual seven-day festival. Those who teach this feast is no longer relevant or valid. Disregard this command right there from the Heavenly Father. Just totally ignore it. Now, Bet Yeshurun celebrates the first day of this feast, the seven-day feast, as a high holy day which means we schedule time off from our jobs to refocus our personal pursuits toward spiritual priorities. We obey the, our Heavenly Father's request for a spiritual family reunion. We eat matzah for seven days to show our commitment to removing the spiritual leaven that's mingled into our lives. Yeah. Indeed, Yahuwah's teachings in our Bible represents the manna from heaven we need for eternal life unlike the worldly teachings that we've been subjected to that come with insincerity, dishonesty, corruption, hypocrisy. Yeah. No, here at Bet Yesharun, we deny ourselves and we follow Yahushua and we eat at spiritual manna. Mm -hmm. Now, some say Paul did away with this festival. Apostle Paul, imagine that. Like he could do away with them. I tell everyone that's hogwash. And they can't explain this message to me when I point them to it. First Corinthians 5, 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul yeah. kept the feast. Yes. Yes. The early church kept the feast. Yes. It was done away with by teachings of men, replaced by other traditions and festivals. We'll get into that later. Now, I know this group, having been trained in calendars, has, uh, has this linear mindset. So I, I put up here for you the upcoming calendar. Uh, it's at the end of March and the beginning of April. It shows the, um, the festivals coming up. And that's the end of uh, month 12. We're into month 12 now. We're into the first week of it. And uh, the new year is going to start right there. That's the, the Rosh Hashanah. We will gather for that day. A lot of people say, well, what happened to the day in between? Well, it's a day. It, it didn't disappear. It's still there. It's still a day. I challenge you to dedicate yourself. You're going from one year to the next. Spend a day dedicating yourself, dedicating your temple to Yah. There were feast of dedications. You can find them in scripture. So if you want to look at a physical temple being dedicated, you'll find that. But Yah is teaching us dedicate ourselves. We are the temples of Elohim. Yeah. So then you go through and um, each, each one, that's so everyone's, and there's the, uh, the feast of Passover. We will celebrate that one probably starting around six o'clock. Uh, that's going to be, uh, I think, on Thursday, is it? But I didn't get this all validated by everyone, but I think this is pretty accurate. On the back table, you have the, uh, the purple list, uh, the purple sheet of all of our upcoming festivals. It's on there. So I suggest you, you grab one of those if you don't already have it. And there's the seven-day unleavened bread. And we close out um, the, the month, right? That's going to be a 30 month, April 17th. And on April 18th, the first day of the second month, we come back here and we celebrate a new month. These are our dates you can come and celebrate with that. Yes, sure. Let's get into the next set of uh, fall feast. This one is the Feast of Trumpets, it has many names. Probably all of you, it's, it's, some will say Yam Teruah, some will call it the Day of Shouting. Uh, I'll spend a little bit of, of time uh, talking about this because all those names really have a, a beautiful picture of what's going on in this feast. Now, uh, it's, a, it's a joyful celebration. We, we celebrated here at Bet Yes Room with, with shouting, joyful shouts, singing praise and worship. Yeah. We, we blow trumpets, we blow those shofars. And that Hebrew word, yam, does mean day, okay? And they're all familiar with that one, talked about it. But teruah 
really means shouting. So the more accurate, it's a shouting. So if you don't have a horn, if you can't blow a horn, you can't blow a trumpet, don't shout it out. It's a day of shouting. There is no reason each and every one of us from men, women, child, old, young, all can shout that day. So it's a day to lift up your voice. Okay, and it's in, it's in Leviticus 23. Verses 23 through 25, then Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, speak to the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing trumpets, a holy convocation, you shall do no customary work on it, and you shall make an offering made by fire to Yahuwah. So we do take a day off from work, and we do gather uh, in fellowship, and we blow those trumpets, it's a, it's a convocation, it's a gathering, it's also a Sabbath rest. It's a day to take your mind off the physical world that we all get entangled with and focus on Yah and his yeah. message. Get a picture of the spiritual side of this feast. It's in Matthew 24, verses 30 through 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So why do we celebrate these feasts? So we can see pictures like this. We can spend some time. We can get away from the world and realize it's more than just these physical events that we're going through. It's not just going through the motions. We're spending time and we're, we're meditating on passages such as this one. And um, these feasts are a blessing of the Heavenly Father. This next annual feast observed 10 days later for Bet Yeshurun, it's a day of atoning for sins so that Yah will cleanse off of us the stains of this world. This also comes directly from our Heavenly Father. It's a day to keep forever. And I'll give you that passage right here. It's an, uh, also an annual fast. I'll get back to that one, but I want you to see the passage here. Numbers 29, 7 through 11. On the 10th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation, shall afflict your souls, the sin offering for atonement. So that affliction of our souls, and it's a gathering. Look, we're all together. Nothing like going through a fast with your brothers and sisters. And, and that's one of the the great times, you know, when we break that fast together. A little late when we break it, but uh, it's a wonderful time. But that annual fast, it's to be observed forever. And it is on the, on the 10th day of the seventh month of the divine year and actually begins in the evening on the ninth day. As many of you know. Let's look at a little bit at those words because these words in Hebrew are important for us to get down. Kippur means expiation, and it came from uh, another Hebrew word, kapar, that verb. That verb there means to cover, means to expiate, cancel, to cleanse, to make atonement, to forgive, to pardon, to reconcile. Now, I, I really added this down. The word is incredibly deep. There's a wealth of meanings in that word kapar. So you can pick your own phrase on how this this fits for you is it a day of forgiveness absolutely is it a day of pardon absolutely is it a day to reconcile with yahuwah absolutely and he did the covering for us he's opened that door and again i don't want you to get all hung up uh, just on the fasting aspect yes the fast is a part of our affliction it's a part of shaking up our physical body so we're we're focused and thinking about the, the spiritual side. And there's a, a passage there from Isaiah. Now, uh, it's a nice little snippet of it, but I, I want to share with you the entire passage because it's so, so good about this fast. And I don't want you to miss it. It's Isaiah 58, one through six. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Yaakov their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake 
the ordinance of their Elohim. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching Elohim. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your labors. Indeed, you fast for light, for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast, an acceptable day to Yahuwah? Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed grow, go free, that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of Yahuwah shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and Yahuwah will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness. Your darkness shall be as noonday. Hallelujah. Well, that's a, that's a, a passage for you to think about and meditate about fasting. And clearly, in ancient times, they had it all messed up. And so it, it probably is natural for us to mess that up. So these passages, Yah sent his prophets to wake us up, to give us messages. They're still speaking to us from their grave. They're speaking to us through these books. I encourage you to not just read them, reflect on each and every aspect of them. Next festival, five days later, after the Day of Atonement. That yes room begins seven days of quality time with our heavenly father. He set apart this time for us to enjoy being with our spiritual loved ones and him. Get you the passage here, Numbers 29, verse 12. On the 15th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. Keep a feast to Yahuwah. Seven days. So that first day is a high holy day. Take time off from our work and we gather. And um, I'll hit some of the highlights of that, the, the Hebrew words there. Uh, it's sukkah. Now that, that's a singular term. Sukkot is the plural form of it. So a sukkah is a booth. It's a tent. It's a cottage. It's a pavilion. It's a tabernacle. Checked out that word tabernacle speaks of it being a temporary shelter. It's a dwelling place. It's the human body where the soul dwells. I thought that was just so awesome to see that because that, now we're living in a temporary house. We're only here a short time. So when we get together at that time of the year and we're, we build that, uh, that physical sukkah and we go in there and we, we kind of sit down and say our prayers every once in a while and go in there, but it's a picture. It's a big picture that we are living in these um, temporary bodies. Important thing is it's, it's a dwelling place for the soul. The soul is what we want to get to dwell with Yah. Here's another awesome passage from the prophet Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 17. It shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahuwah Zavayot, to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever the families of the earth do not come unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahuwah Zavayot, on them there will be no rain. Now this group knows what the spiritual picture of rain is, right? It's a council of Elohim. So there there is coming a day when everyone is going to know about this feast and they're going to go up to celebrate it. And if they don't, 
they're not going to have the council of Elohim. That's why we, we gather for these feasts. We're coming to get that spiritual rain that Yah offers. Now, Israel did celebrate the harvest, which is the time. This is after the end of the, the harvest season. And to the Israelites, it was a, a wonderful time. You're celebrating all those uh, harvest, uh, the fruits and vegetables that they had. Because why? Because that meant they were going to survive through the winter, mm -hmm. the time of darkness, the cold. You were able to stockpile what they were going to need. So we likewise are celebrating this feast. It isn't the last one, though. There's one more known as the last great day. It's a feast of Yahuwah. The fall feast, in fact, end after this one more day of fellowship with Yahuwah. Comes in Numbers 29, verse 35. The eighth day, have a sacred assembly. Do no customary work. Another high holy day. Make sure you schedule time off. Don't be stuck at work. Come on in and, and be here. This is the, the greatest day of them all. Many people probably don't realize that. This is the best celebration of them all. That last great day. Marks the end of the fall festivals. And at Bet Yeshurun, we do obey that command. You can see the eighth is Shemenye mean in solemn assembly so you'll hear it sometimes shemene yatsara that's what we call this festival in the hebrew it's a solemn assembly so there's some solemnity involved in this celebration but also a solemn day last in the greek is that word eskatos means the extreme point of life just before death. So this is the picture I want you to start having when we're getting into this. This is wrapping up all the festivals. It's, it's, um, all, of, all of these festivals are showing Elohim's plan of salvation for humanity. And you, and you don't, if you're not doing it, you're, you're going to miss a lot of this stuff or if you replace it with other festivals. But it's a great day. It's a mega, mega, camera. big, it's huge, it's ginormous day what's going on we're holding back we're staying in close to yah we're assembling we're keeping close real close to yah that's where we want to be yeah the spiritual picture here is yah is dwelling among us forever it pictures our transition into the realm of eternity. It's captured here in John's Revelation, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from those who faced the earth and the heaven fled away. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before Elohim and books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. They were judged, each one according to his works. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now you can see why it was, it's a solemn day. Not everyone's going to make it. And it's not that Yah doesn't want them. He wants all to be aware. He wants them all to understand these feats. He wants, he's, this invitation goes out to everyone. It's not just to the Yehudim, not just to their cousins, the Israelites. It also comes out to the, the Gentiles, the ones that have been scattered all over the world. But it comes out to anyone who wants to come to know Yahuwah through the son Yahushua. He died so that that door would be open. And that's what we really celebrate on that day. Yes, that last great day is a, is a special observance. And we're going to celebrate it with blowing of shofars and gathering. Prayers, praise, and worship. And I put up here for you, uh, those who like the linear format, this is the, the calendar. And I'll mention that there is a Bet Yes Room calendar coming out. Uh, 
you've got to get to the printer and eventually you'll have one of these. But for right now, you've got the, the purple sheet in the back so you can write down all your, your dates. There's really no reason you can't get those onto your, your calendars right now. And you can see this is the fall festivals. We start off, there's the day of trumpets, the very first day of the seventh month. It's going to be in that September, October timeframe, September 17th. So for your long range planning, High Holy Day, take it off. Fasting, make sure you're not working. That's a, turns out to be a Sunday, but the world has people working on Sunday, Saturdays, uh, any day of the week, seven, seven times 24. That's seven days a week, 24 hours a day. They'll find people to work. Let it not be so with Yaz people. <laughs> now here's uh, Sukkot starting on October 1st. Here you see the seven days. And we wrap it up on October 8th with the, the last great day. So those right there are all uh, high holy days, as is that one. But I suggest you might want to schedule your fall vacation from work and spend some time at Bet Yeshurun. I want you to think cyclically. So I put uh, this calendar back up there, the divine calendar, and uh, post for you here. Because I want you to get a picture, because you don't see this picture until you look at things in a cyclical format. But look at how these spring and fall festivals are, are correlate. They're just like on the opposite side. And you can see the same pattern. So it, this, this is so yeah, like, I mean, you don't see this. What I never saw it until I posted it up on this, this circular view. When you, uh, but it's, it's right there, hidden in plain sight. Yah's pattern. He wants us to understand things about him, spiritual things through these phys physical events that we, we keep. Know why this thing is sticking up there, but I'll read you the, uh, the question because I've given these presentations in the past and I've uh, always asked people to uh, ask me questions and that, and this was a good one. The question up there, you can't see it all because of that Zoom block there. It goes, why doesn't BYA observe Jewish holidays like Purim and Hanukkah? The short answer is because those are human teachings and traditions. They're not divine appointments. Now, you want to see that. It's in the book of Esther, chapter 9, 26 through 28. So they called these days Purim after the name Pur. Therefore, because of what had happened to them, the Yahudim established and imposed it on themselves and their descendants and all who would join them, that without fail, they should celebrate these two days every year according to the written instructions and according to the prescribed time that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, that these days of Purim should not fail to be observed among the Yahudim and the memory, and that the memory of them should not perish among their descendants. Now, I, you know, I'm not going to make any big deal out of them keeping their, their feast days, but when they keep feast and don't uh, keep Yah's feast, then I start having them. Heartburn. Now here's the, the second Maccabees. This is about Hanukkah now, right out of second Maccabees 10, 6 through 8. That's out of the New American uh, Bible. They kept eight days with joy. Even notes parenthetically, it's Hanukkah. After the manner of the Feast of Tabernacles, they now carried bows, green branches, palms for him, that had given them good success in cleansing his place. They ordained a com by common statute and decree that all the nation of the Yahuna should keep those days every year. So again, it's a, it's a Jewish tradition. It's a Jewish teaching. And, and if you look at the, the similarities uh, to the Feast of Tabernacles, which we just talked about, it almost looks like it's a replica. They're trying to move it into the winter time, out of the fall into the winter, and it has um, things that, that, you know, believers need to be aware of. You need to, to think about these things because otherwise you can get swept up in the emotion of all these. Now, here's another question I got. Isn't there a scripture passage about the Messiah keeping the Feast of Hanukkah? Hmm, a good one. 
I was able to find it. It's in John 10, 22 through 23. This comes out of the Hebrew names version. I think it's in our scriptures, uh, the Hebrew scriptures that we like to read here at Bet Yesharun. And, that, and that, that verse goes, it was the feast of Hanukkah at Yerushalayim. It was winter. Yeshua was walking in the temple in Shlomo's porch. That got me searching around. What's going on here? Well, here it is out of the, the King James, the new King James version, same passage. Now it was the feast of dedication, parentheses, tabernacles in Jerusalem. And it was winter, the rainy season. Yahushua walked in the temple in Shalomo's porch. Yes, the rainy season started in uh, right after that harvest, after the fall harvest, which is right when tabernacles was being celebrated. In fact, some, uh, some people said they were even praying for rain. They wanted the rain on the crops so that they could have next spring, the barley would grow and the wheat would grow. So the translators just uh, popped in winter. That eh, seems okay to them. We, we looked at the feast, but the rainy season really starts in Israel, beginning in the fall, goes through the winter, and then it begins to dry up in the spring. So I want you to be aware of it. This is Yeshua certainly kept tabernacles. Let me take a look at that a little bit. Now, here's another question. Well, why doesn't Bet Yeshurun observe Christian holidays like Christmas and Easter? Hmm. Same answer, because those are human teachings and traditions, not divine appointments. Another one. Isn't there a verse in the Bible about Easter? Yep, I found one. It's in Acts 12, 4, King James Version. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him and tending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Easter. He hadn't even been killed yet, which is what the celebration of Easter is. And they're, they're uh, talking about that. Acts 12, 4 comes right out of the new King James version. They caught it. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Absolutely correct. It was the spring. It was after Passover. We know that because we talked about that a couple of slides earlier. Now, the King James Version translates Pascha, which is that Greek word, as Passover 28 times. There's the one time up above where it got put in as Easter. We have to be careful on reading, okay, and running off of one verse. When you see something that doesn't make sense or seems to contradict things that you've learned, check it out. Dig deeper. Ask Pastor Obadiah. Getting all kinds of Zoom signals here. Okay, Easter was Pascha from Pesach, and it is right out of Strong's. Now, the word speaks of the dangers of ignorance and disobedience. Consider Luke 12, 47 through 48. That servant who knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself nor did according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be be beaten with a few stripes. For unto whomever much is given of him shall be much required. And unto whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. So I want you to catch that ignorance of the law is no excuse. There is some striking going on here. Now, granted, those who really know about the will and they're just being rebellious, they're going to be beaten with many stripes. But let us not be among the ignorant ones. And I don't know about you. I'll speak for myself. I don't want to get beaten anymore. I've been beaten enough. And praise Yah, he's starting to reveal things to me. And, and we're doing the best I can on his, his path. So heading on that, Bet Yeshurun keeps the Heavenly Father's appointments. And I, and I guess 
um, well, no, just wrap up. I'll go back to this one just a little bit because I want to. Bottom line, these are human traditions, not divine ones. Beware of holidays that aren't among Elohim's holy days. Now, I'll admit I participated in Christian holidays. I even enjoyed celebrating St. Patrick's Day and Fat Tuesday, always known as Mardi Gras. I also learned that the Jewish faith has similar celebrations like Hanukkah and Purim. Then I also heard about other traditions like Kwanzaa. These festivals are worldwide big economic business. But it's not be ignorant of them. I bet Yeshurun does indeed keep the Heavenly Father's appointments like his son, and we'll see it right here. John 5, 19 through 20. Verily I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For what things soever he does, these also does the son likewise. For the son, will, father loves the son and shows him all things that himself does. And he will show him greater work than these that you may marvel. So keep in mind, we're children of Elohim too. That's how much he loves his son. And that's how much his son loved him. He keeps his festivals. He's going to show even greater work. So through our, our obedience to doing his will and doing what he does, he, he, there's nothing here. The heavenly father's not asking us to do something. These are heavenly feasts that are being celebrated. And, and we're working them out here on the, in the physical. His son showed us how. Out of John 14, 21 through 24, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the fathers who sent me you hear so many people. Oh, I love Yeshua. I love Jesus. I love. Then they don't do the word. So if they love the heavenly father, that's why we do it. We're seeking to be obedient children. We're showing them we love him. And he's going to pour about loving blessings onto us. We haven't even uh, the, the marvels we're going to see from him. The works that he's going to show us. And be impressive. Heed the word, walk the heavenly father's way of the state from Yahushua in court in Matthew 16, 24 through 25. Then Yahushua said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. So pick up your torture stakes. This is not an easy walk, but isn't it so much nicer when you're doing it with others that are trying to, they're struggling the same as you. We help each other out. So indeed, Bet Yeshurun follows the Messiah in keeping divine annual appointments. And the Gospel of John testifies of this one right here. So referring to the last great day of the feast. You see it there, John 7, 37 through 20, 38. I have another one here for you. Take you back, and that's the fall one. Let's go back to the, the spring festival, Matthew 26, 17. Now, on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Yahushua, saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Yeshua was keeping Passover. The disciples were keeping Passover. The apostles. Praise Yah. Found some believers here at Bet Yeshurun that are keeping Passover too. Yeah. If you don't want it to. Here's another great one. A great question. If, if I discuss the divine appointed times, my family thinks I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. Now, the good reaction to that now is just graciously accept your family's reaction if they think you've lost your mind. I hear this so many times from so many people at Bet Yeshurun. I've heard it myself. And it's a, it's a legitimate complaint. And so that, you know, 
who wants their family to think they're crazy? And so it's a legitimate, but you need to acknowledge it. Okay, acknowledge that it's going to happen. And it may happen. It may not happen. Who knows? Maybe one of the brothers or sisters will say, hey, well, that's kind of interesting. I want to check it out. And then they'll, they'll start doing it. Because you're in great company when people think you've lost your mind. Consider this passage out of Mark chapter 3, verse 21. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him. So they said he is out of his mind. Guess who they're talking about there? It's Yahushua. Mm -hmm. One of their own families. He He's crazy. Let's grab him and lock him up. Get him off the streets. Or he's going to get himself killed. A little further on in Mark 3, 31 through 35. Then his brothers and his mother came. Standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. It's his brother and his mother. A multitude was sitting around him. And they said to him, look, your mother, your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them saying, who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of Elohim is my brother, my sister, and mother. So Yah is doing the same thing for us here. You have a spiritual family. When you're attending these festivals and you come to Sabbath services, you are amongst your, your brother and your sister and mother. And, and keep praying for your physical family. May they be here. There's plenty of family members, though, that are in this assembly. So we know prayer works. Yeah, I answers our prayer. So keep praying. Nonetheless, as believers, we are to share the good news as we're led by the Holy Spirit. Don't keep it into yourself. It's going to be painful at times. Now, Acts 26, 22 through 25. Therefore, having obtained help from Elohim to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moshe said would come, that the Messiah would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Yahudim and to the Gentiles. Now, as he made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he says, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. Great one for you to remember. Question I'll have for this group. It's Elohim calling you to be I'm not spot here. Yep, calling you to keep his annual appointments. Second Corinthians chapter 6, 16 through 18. And what agreement has the temple of Elohim with idols? For you are the temple of the living Elohim. As Elohim has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate says Yahuwah, do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says Yahuwah Almighty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at that. Sons and daughters, we're all in that group. He's called, he wants to be our father. Praise you. In Isaiah 1, 9 through 10, Unless Yahuwah Zavayot had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. Hear the word of Yahuwah, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law, to the Torah of our Elohim, you people of Gomorrah. So this is going to be a remnant group. We're going to be a, a small. This is not the way of, uh, of the, a megachurch. In fact, if you're in a mega church, you might want to start asking yourself, am I in the right spot? And uh, it could be a stepping stone because we all came into this small little remnant of believers from all kinds of walks. Out of the Jewish faith, out of the Roman Catholicism, out of the Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, I'm always amazed at how uh, many different faith walks people have come into this assembly with. It's all Yah's plan. He's calling. 
So are you among a remnant saying yes to our mm -hmm. heavenly father's call? Yes. Romans 9, 27. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. Mm -hmm. Sand of the sea can't even count those. Mm -hmm. There's a remnant. Revelation 22, 17, and the Ruach and the bride say, come, let him who hears us come, let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Oh, wow, can't even see my closing passage. I'll have to read it for you. Truly, these times of ignorance Elohim overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. So undoubtedly, Yah has been overlooking our, our shortcomings, but it's going to end. He wants us to, uh, to change, and by learning when to gather at the times Elohim wants to meet, by offering our bodies as a sacrifice to Elohim, a living sacrifice, we also assemble to encourage each other to persist through our trials and tribulations to come into his presence with our offerings. Yet what he really asks of us is to keep the faith. Yeah. Never waver in trusting and depending upon our heavenly father who repeatedly calls out to us to come to him, yeah. to repent, to change from our way of doing yeah. things and come into his way of doing things. Yeah. This, these festivals are a way of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So, out of Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, I always like to have Scripture give the last word. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaches, until then, let us keep the faith and may God's mercy and grace be upon us all. Amen.